Welcome back to our monthly Spine Fellow Talk. I'm Peter Cohn, and today we'll be talking about um, subaxial cervical spine trauma, um, which is a nice follow-up uh, to Nina's last talk uh, about the upper cervical spine. Uh, so uh, we'll brief outline. We'll talk about epidemiology. Uh, we'll touch on anatomy and biomechanics, and then we'll go through the evaluation uh, initial evaluation and management of cervical spine trauma, and then we'll go through um, some different fracture classifications and treatments and some specific fracture types. Um, so epidemiology, um, the incidence of uh, cervical spine fractures is about 60 per 100,000 per year, and they represent about 2.4% uh, of blunt trauma patients. And oh, for some reason, oh, there we go. Um, and the cervical spine is the most common site of spinal cord injuries, about 55 to 70 percent of spinal cord injuries. Um, and so uh, these graphs on the right are in relation to uh, spinal cord injuries, not necessarily cervical spine, but you can look at um, uh, the causes of these injuries. Most commonly, obviously, uh, motor vehicle crashes and falls, particularly in the elderly. Um, and if you look at uh, the cost of these injuries, they're very high, especially for spinal cord injuries. Um, and obviously those costs get higher um, with the worse the injury or the higher the spinal cord injury. Um, so these cervical spine injuries are a big burden on our medical system, but also devastating for the patients, obviously. Um, and then if you look at uh, this data from NASCIS uh, and looking at spinal cord injuries, you can see life expending life expectancies for patients after their injury based on both their starting age and their type of injury. Um, and you can see obviously that um, as the injuries become higher uh, or your life expectancy, expectancy becomes shorter. And then, so just to continue on about the prevalence of these, about two to 5% of or uh, prevalence of cervical spine fractures or injuries, about 2 to 5% of all trauma admissions in the United States will have a cervical spine fracture. Um, and subaxial spine injuries represent about 65 to 75% of, of fractures and 75% of all dislocations in the cervical spine, and particularly at C7-T1 and that uh, cervical thoracic junction accounts for about 17% of all cervical injuries. Uh, so looking at the anatomy of the cervical spine um, with this nice netters picture, uh, to go over some basics uh, that are helpful, particularly in the OR when you're uh, trying to determine your levels, uh, you have bifid spinous processes from C3 uh, to C6. Usually C7 is uh, not bifid. Um, you get stability in the cervical spine from both the Bony, dynamic, uh, bony anatomy as well as the ligamentous um, anatomy as well. And in terms of bony anatomy of your facet joints that limit your range of motion to some degree as well as your uncle for debral joints. But obviously the neck is very mobile and so a lot of the stability of the neck is dynamic stability and that comes from your ligamentous stability. Anteriorly that's mostly from the ALL and posteriorly that's mostly from the facet capsules. Um, you have another picture, but there's also uh, the whole posterior ligamentous complex as well. And I have another picture of that coming up. And um, this is just another picture of uh, the uncovertebral joints and, you know, a more AP picture. So there's your uncus and your uncinet process is up here. Um, when talking about anatomy, it's important to know the bony anatomy in relation to the neural and vascular structures. So as you look at the foramen, the posterior part of that foramen is the superior facet, um, which often is the cause of uh, nerve root uh, injuries um, in these fractures. Uh, the superior cortical surface of the facet is uh, concave in the coronal plane and convex in the sagittal plane. And as you go down the spine, the orientation of the facet changes and you know, goes from more uh, outfacing anteriorly to uh, more outfacing or in-facing, I guess you could say. 
um, and the spinal cord diameter uh, averages about eight millimeters. Of course, when we talk about um, the cervical spine, particularly surgery around the cervical spine, you want to know um, where the uh, important structures are. And obviously, the vertebral artery is a very <laughs> important structure. And there's a lot of blood throw through there that is critical to oxygenating the brain. So you want to know where that is at all times. Um, and they can, you can divide the vertebral artery up into sections. There's the V1 section, which is the preforaminal section. The V2 section, which usually extends from C3 to C6, although in about 5 to 10 percent of people, the vertebral artery can enter the frame at C7. Um, the V3 segment um, is from C2 to the skull base, and it, the artery is still extradural. However, once um, the artery enters the skull base, uh, it becomes intradural. Um, in terms of biomechanics, and I, I'll talk about the degrees in a second, but this is a picture uh, that shows the ligamentous structures in the back and really uh, pictures all the different components of the uh, posterior ligamentous complex. Um, so there's the facet capsules, you have your supraspinous ligament, you have your interspinous ligaments, and nicely pictured in yellow, like in real life, you have the ligamentum flavum. Um, in terms of range of motion, uh, about 50% of all your flexion and extension comes from your occiput and C1 joint, and about 50% of all rotation comes from your C1 to C2 joint, and the remaining flexion and rotation come from uh, almost about equal parts, um, all the rest of the five joints uh, within the cervical spine, and almost all of the lateral bending comes from your subaxial cervical spine. So this is just... Uh, that summarized in a chart. Um, but the point here is that there's a lot of range of motion uh, in the cervical spine. And if you think about just the poor design of this as we became upright um, beings, you have a bowling ball or you know a heavy cranium sitting on a very rigid thoracic spine. And you have this very short, very mobile um, segment in between um, where you can have a lot of injuries. So for initial evaluations, when, when trauma patients come in and you have a suspicion for a cervical spine injury, really the key is you always have to have a suspicion. Um, certain things in your history may make that suspicion go up, so higher energy mechanisms, um, any patient uh, with a history of transient neurologic symptoms, or patients with a history of ankylosing spondylitis or DISH or previous uh, cervical spine surgeries, uh, all those things should put you uh, on high alert for a cervical spine injury. Um, in general, there's um, some Canadian, well, I'll show the Canadian rules in a second, but uh, in terms of when patients present to the emergency room, if they come as a trauma patient, it's generally a little bit different of a story because you already have that high energy mechanism, so you should always be looking for a C-spine injury, but in other cases, um, as long as patients have no tenderness in their cervical spine, they're sober and able to communicate clearly and remember the event and no evidence of um, intoxication and no distracting injuries without any mechanism to suggest a cervical spine injury, then you could skip um, imaging. Um, there is a Canadian C-spine rule in terms of initial C-spine mobilization when patients present to the emergency department. Um, and they have different risk factors uh, to push you towards uh, mobilization or not. Really, and you can see what will get to your collar. Really, you want to be more cautious than uncautious. So anyone over 65, dangerous mechanisms or any neurologic symptoms, as we discussed, will get a collar. Um, and then these, you know, these are the Canadian rules, but a simple rear end MVC, so not high speed, not out of the car, pedestrian struck or anything like that. Um, if you meet any of these criteria, uh, then you can potentially be cleared. Um, and then you also have to clear their spine in terms of ability to, for, of the patient to rotate uh, their spine 45 degrees in each direction. So, and I'll, in a minute, we'll talk about um, 
start the initial evaluation and imaging as it pertains to trauma patients, which is a little bit different. Um, but in terms of your initial evaluation, uh, when you see these patients, this is a picture that a lot of us know pretty well, but this is um, the form that is available for the Asia classification. And I put this on just to show how detailed your exam has to be for all of these patients, um, because your neurologic exam really, to down to the smallest detail in terms of which, exactly which dermatones they have sensation or loss of sensation is really important in determining um, your treatment algorithm. Um, so for all our spinal trauma patients, we're making sure to have a very detailed motor and sensory exam, and the sensory exam is supposed to have light touch and pinprick. And you know this picture, I think, shows well um, the different uh, key sensory points, which I think are really helpful when you're trying to do a sensory exam, as dermatomes are a little fluid and exactly you know where the borders are. But if you stick to these points, it can be a much more accurate exam and a more reproducible exam. Uh, so once a patient comes in and you're able to examine them, um, you can give them, based on their exam, a neurologic uh, level of injury. Um, and in terms, and you can divide that into a sensory injury and a motor injury and then combine that into their total injury level. So the sensory injury level would be the, uh, the, lev the lowest level of intact sensation. The motor injury level would be the lowest level of motor strength, which is three of, out of five or greater, and then the total uh, neurologic uh, level of injury would be uh, the comp whichever of those is the lower number. Um, you also have to determine if the patient has a complete or incomplete injury and, and, or an Asia A injury, and we'll talk about the AIS grade here. I think this can be confusing if just because it's graded in reverse for whatever reason, so a grade A is the worst and a grade E is um, the best uh, in terms of no motor sensory symptoms. So I always like to think of it going backwards to help uh, keep things straight in my mind. So grade E, there's no motor sensory uh, uh, findings on exam. A grade D is intact sensation, but you have some weakness uh, below the level of injury, but all the the majority of the muscle groups will have an injury of muscle grades greater than three. Uh, grade C, now the, the level below the injury, their muscle grades, the majority of them are less than three. Grade B, you've now lost motor and only maintained sensory with uh, sensation intact in the S3 and S4 nerve root distributions. And the grade A would be a complete with loss, complete loss of sensory and motor function. In terms of imaging, uh, the ATLS protocol is to always obtain a lateral spine film. So ATLS is the imaging they always recommend is an AP chest, an AP pelvis, and a lateral C-spine image. And the key to that lateral C-spine image, if that is what you're going to base your trauma evaluation on, is that lateral C-spine image has to include the C7-T1 joint. And if it doesn't, then that's not a good enough image, and you should think about getting a CT. Um, and especially in trauma patients who are often lying down, it can be really hard to see that C7-T1 um, junction because the shoulders ride up and often obscure that uh, area in the image. Um, so because of that, a lot of places have moved to using a CT for all traumas. Uh, which will give you a much more uh, sensitive exam for picking up any uh, uh, cervical spine fractures or injuries. Um, looking at the lateral, there are different lines that we use uh, to determine any signs of instability or um, rotation or displacement or angulation. Um, so those are pictured here. Uh, for a full x-ray series, if you're looking specifically for an injury, that should always include or you know that there is an injury that should always include a lateral, an AP, and an open mouth um, odontoid view. And then if a cervical injury is found, it's very important to image the rest of the spine as there's about a 10 to 15 percent rate of non-continuous injuries in the spine. And really MRI, 
depending on where you are, but for the most part, it's really not, it's certainly not a great tool for screening. It's expensive. It's hard to get. It's not timely. Um, and it often has a high false positive rate. So to use an MRI for screening is not very helpful. It can be helpful in certain situations once an injury is picked up to help determine um, your treatment plan. Uh, so things to look for on imaging to help indicate um, instability are uh, translation of the vertebral bodies and kyphosis more than 11 degrees. And kyphosis can be measured with the Cobb angle or with the posterior vertebral body tangent method. Um, so now we'll kind of jump into, you know, we've gone through the basics of, uh, you know, yeah. Can I stop you for just one second? Of course. Go back a slide, please. Yes. So my understanding, because the 11 degree number mm -hmm. comes from the old Punjabi and white right. criteria of cervical spine stability based on cadaver work. Mm -hmm. My understanding was that it's not 11 degrees of kyphosis. It's mm -hmm. a, an 11 degree difference between one level and the level next to it. So, because the cervical spine is mostly lordotic. Correct. So if you have a level, the level C34 is 15 degrees of lordosis and C56 is 15 degrees of lordosis and C45 is three degrees of kyphosis, mm -hmm. that's considered pathologic because the difference between right. patient levels is more than 11. So is this, is your slide saying 11 degrees of kyphosis, is that based on different work or a misinterpretation of Punjabi and white? No, it's just not a clear description. Uh, it's, I should have been more detailed in describing that, but you're right. And it's really, um, as you said, it, when you compare the levels above and below, if you have, when you have that difference of 11, I mean, really you're, it's not just, going to be the angle but you're also going to almost see some disruption in this smooth line um well that may but it all kind of I'm, combines I'm but that I'm was saying, you're correct it, that is the it, it's a, it's not 11 degrees of of kyphosis it's a difference of 11 degrees from the adjacent one of the adjacent levels yes just to be clear for everybody yeah people refer to it as relative right maybe right. you should just i'll just add relative it's relative stuff. yeah okay and, well change your dot change your diagrams because they, they're not yeah. correct right? i was just doing that to I know. basic angle but, but i got you the, the illustrations lead you to believe that you're talking about a kyphosis angle rather than a, a a relative angle got it um so uh we'll we'll get into now the different types of fractures and different types of classification systems um, and then we'll touch on treatment options sort of as we go. Um, one of the earlier classification systems, uh, which was really more of a descriptive system uh, based on mechanism, was the Allison, Allen and Ferguson classification, which really had six main fracture types, but then there were some subtypes. And I think in the end, you could have almost, I think it was 21 different types of fracture. Um, this was really the first attempt at trying to uh, include, you know, every type of cervical injury um, into a classification system. It did not supply any uh, uh, instruction for treatment based on their classification. Uh, it did not really hint at any prognosis based on it. It was purely a descriptive model, and it really did have some difficulties with poor intra-observer reliability. Um, and so it's really, it's a more of historical interest. It was used um, for some research and there's still some papers that compare the reliability or the inner observable reliability of this compared to other systems, but it tends to be less helpful, although it's good to know um, some of these descriptive terms uh, as they will be used um, by different surgeons when communicating about these fractures. Uh, in 2007, um, the SLIC score, or the subaxial cervical spine injury classification system, came about. Um, and the idea behind this 
uh, system was not necessarily to classify uh, fractures based on you know groups or types, but really they wanted to come up with a system to um, guide uh, management decisions. And so similar to the TELIC score, um, they created a port a point system um, where if uh, your point if you had four greater points, well, sorry, if you have four points, it's sort of a gray area, but greater than four points, um, surgery is generally recommended, and less than four points, generally it's safe to consider non-operative treatment. Um, and the advantage and the advantage of the system that there's a lot of it's relatively straightforward to calculate, and that there's a high um, validity in terms of uh, treatment and evaluation of the fractures. Um, and it also places a lot of importance in the discoligamentous <clears throat> complex, which is composed of the intervertebral disc, the ALL and PLL, the ligament and flavum, interspinous. You know, we've talked about these before. Um, but the key when, you know, a key part of this score is whether that's disrupted or not. Um, to really determine if those elements are disrupted, um, an MRI is probably the best to look at those, each of those elements specifically. However, if all you have is CT or X-ray, there are still findings that you can use to infer that the discoligamentous complex is disrupted. Um, so any a normal facet alignment um, represents an absolute indication for a disruption of that complex. For the obviously for the facets to you know disrupt or not be aligned correctly, you would have to have an injury to that facet capsule, which, as we mentioned, is the strongest part of that uh, posterior tension band. And then any abnormal widening of the anterior disc base represents. Um, an injury to the ALL, and that would also be considered an absolute um, indication of a discoligamentous complex disruption. So, um, you know, I will, we'll go through some fractures a little later to kind of talk about how to use this, um, but uh, really just including the morphology, um, the ligamentous stability, and the neurologic status are the key components for that score. Um, more recently, uh, the uh, AO spine subaxial cervical spine injury system um, was developed, and the goal was to create a relatively um, simplified uh, classification symptom for both research and clinical purposes. Um, it does not yet have a, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, have a score associated with it to um, guide management in the same way that the SLIC does, but it does add facet pathology um, to the classification system, um, which was not really included in the SLIC score. Um, and it does have high inter-observer and inter and intra-observer reliability. So for the AO system, there are A types, B types, Z types, and F types, which would be the facet types. So A types are more anterior column injuries. Um, and different morphologies of these uh, without any uh, posterior tension band um, uh, injury associated with them. So they include minor kind of non-structural, non-displaced fractures, spinous process fractures, all the way to complete burst fractures. Um, B-type fractures are more are tension or distraction injuries, either anteriorly or posteriorly. So you can have disruption of the posterior tension band, either osseous or ligamentous, and then you can have disruption of the anterior tension band in an extension injury. Translational injuries are type C type, or excuse me, translational injuries are C type. And then the facet injuries are included in this F type um, component, where you can have non displaced fractures, uh, fractures with potential for instability, and we'll go through some uh, facet fracture types in a minute, um, floating lateral mass fractures, and uh, perched subluxor dislocated facet fractures. Um, and so grouping fractures into these categories can be more helpful um, when talking about uh, the injuries because they're relatively straightforward. As I mentioned, the reliability is good. There are lots of uh, 
modifiers for these, which are probably not worth remembering than ends and numbers, as most of these are, can be used descriptively when talking about the patient, but they do, um, they can affect treatment, particularly when we're talking about um, neurologic injuries. Um, sorry. So as I mentioned, we're, they're still working on a score um, to work in combination with this classification symptom to help guide treatment. Although in general, you can consider B and C types operative. We'll talk about uh, different uh, facet type fractures in the treatment of those. And A types, depending on the, any associated neurologic injury or you know, in some cases it's controversial, but um, alignment, uh, kyphotic alignment, that may push you towards an operative indication, but otherwise many of these could be treated non-operatively in a collar. So we'll talk about burst fractures first, which would be that AO, you know, A-type fracture. Um, and these are generally a compressive injury uh, causing loss of height. And with that loss of height, you can get the bone has to go somewhere and you can get retropulsion into the canal causing neurologic injury. Um, in terms of mechanical stability of these fractures, uh, excessive loss of height, increasing kyphosis, that relative 11 degrees of kyphosis, and particularly any interspinous widening or facet widening that you see posteriorly, those things can indicate mechanical instability and would push you more towards um, operative management. Um, looking at uh, these burst fractures with axial compression, if you were to use the slick score for these, the morphology would get you two points. In general, they are less likely to have discal ligamentous complex injuries. However, as I mentioned, if you see any signs of that, that would push you more towards operative fixation. I mean, really what pushes these injuries uh, towards surgery is uh, the uh, neurologic injury component um, due to that retropulsion. Um, and so if you have that neurologic injury and with the burst fragment, that, ten, that would be an operative injury to relieve the pressure and give stability. Um, so for these burst fractures, neurocompromise is almost always treated with um, an anterior decompression with a corpectomy. Um, decompression and fixation um, in patients who are neurologically intact and do not show any signs of uh, discal ligamentous uh, complex injury. Um, it can be controversial, but often those could be treated or those are more likely to be treated non-operatively. Um, you know, flexion, compressive injuries, um, Again, that's more of a descriptive term based on mechanism, but for the AO classification, we'd be talking about uh, more of a B-type fracture here um, that includes a tension band injury. Um, and these result in uh, angular momentum, so again, flexion forward um, with a resultant fracture anteriorly and some sort of tension injury posteriorly. Often we'll see these on x-ray as either this flexion teardrop fracture, which can be larger than this, and I'll show a picture in a second, or you can have a quadrangular fracture, which is really a split through the body and almost more of a, just a larger teardrop injury. Um, an example can be seen here where you have, you can imagine the flexion of the spine and then compression as the upper segment went down and sheared off this bone fragment here. Um, and these, uh, you know, this case is relatively straightforward to determine instability uh, as it's a C-type fracture, really. Uh, but these are treated uh, most commonly today with both anterior and posterior fixation for improved stability. Um, traditionally, these were treated in a halo, um, but there are retrospective studies demonstrating that internal fixation gives, um, uh, provides better outcomes. And so these are almost always unstable injuries, as I mentioned, they're B types, so there's a tension band injury. So uh, whether or not there's neurologic injury, their um, surgical uh, intervention is indicated. Extension distraction injuries, um, 
So these are most commonly seen in elderly patients, and often all you'll see are anterior inferior end plate fractures, which represent an avulsion fracture from the ALL. Um, you may, these can be difficult to appreciate and can be non-displaced, and sometimes you're only picked up on CT. Um, so these are known as that ex quote unquote extension teardrop. Um, and as I mentioned, most commonly these happen in elderly, these happen in old elderly patients who fall. Um, and the most common neurologic deficit from these is a central cord syndrome. And so you'll have patients come in, sometimes they may not even have this fracture, but um, an elderly patient falls, hits their head, and now they have lower or upper uh, the central cord symptoms, upper extremity worse than lower. Um, and in talking about treatment of that central cord, this fracture in itself is not an unstable injury. So having these extension teardrops does not indicate um, an unstable injury injury and these can be treated reliably in a collar. Um, when you start talking about surgery is a little controversial, particularly with central cord syndrome. Often what we will say is that if there's a central cord syndrome, we'll get an MRI. If there is evidence of continued pressure on the cord, that may push you towards surgery, whereas if there's evidence of no continued pressure, um, you can watch those patients for recovery um, of their neurologic injury while treating the fracture in a collar. Um, so we're going to spend a little more time talking about uh, facet dislocations and fractures. Pete, just, yeah. to, just to clarify, because I don't know if you're going to go into, you're probably not going to go into all the granularity of all the different cord injuries, but just right. for clarification of a central cord, I mean, typically there are central cords that have, I mean, you, you said something very subtle, but it's important to just clarify. Most patients with central cord injuries um, are in that either in the very elderly group with a lot of spondylosis and they always have some level of cervical stenosis or right. cord compression, right? And the people typically that we just sort of allow, you know, uh, non-operative management and observation are patients that may have a central cord and then they rapidly recover, right? right. And then we usually counsel them. Um, they all have cord compression, right? Which which sort of creates some kind of distinction between what you just said um as not a a, a complete truth right? right but but um but in those patients that are recovering we typically will sort of counsel them you know they're they become asia d's almost right and we mm -hmm. counsel them and then we see them back in the office because there's a, a component of them that will decline over time as well from their cord mm -hmm. compression and then we do a myelopathy operation you know down the road then there's a component of people with central cords that that recover plateau but not at a significant level and those patients are more likely to get early surgery mm -hmm. and then there's central cords in a younger group of patients and those patients don't typically have fractures associated with it then there's central cords in a younger group of patients that have any type of fractured you know dislocation or fracture associated with it and those are unstable, and those patients always get surgery, right? Right. I think I would, I, I totally agree. Um, and I think I, when I was talking about that, I was thinking about a recent patient, but I, I, we've seen some younger patients where they don't have diffuse uh, cervical disease, but they have some disease and they have an injury. And there, I know there's some evidence that acute intervention even in the setting of, an, uh, of a stable injury or no fracture um, in those patients may provide some improved recovery. Um, so I really, I just wanted to hint at that if you have. Um, yeah, uh, those patients are, once again, if you get into the granularity of the data, mm -hmm. um, those are typically Asia C's 
and less. Mm -hmm. The Asia D's and above, so Asia D and E, right? Observed, but Asia C's, B's, and A's are typically sooner is better than later. You're correct. Right. And then, of course, just to keep talking about it, since we are, you know, the recovery rates of central cord as you get older become significantly worse in terms of your ability to ambulate again. But it's mostly predicated, as you said, on the initial injury um, classification. They're neurologic. Injuries. Yeah, correct. Th this is Kavanaugh. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about when I operate on these patients, the trajectory of their recovery, I think, is critical, you know, examining them and seeing how they do. Because anesthesia, and anesthesia by its very nature is a hy hypotensive event. Right. And so the last thing you want to do in a patient that's recovering, that's getting better, is subject a patient to hypotension, you know, iatrogenically. So, you know, that's one of the considerations that I have. And I'm very careful about the pressure monitoring and map pushes and, you know, all that stuff, both in and out of the operating room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. The, when the spinal cord is injured, you know, normally in a non-injured spinal cord, the, the spinal cord perfusion pressure does not correlate with the mean arterial pressures because your spinal cord can auto-regulate the blood flow. But with an injured spinal cord, the ability for the spinal cord to auto-regulate itself is, is, is not there. So the blood flow to the spinal cord becomes very contingent upon the mean arterial pressure which is why we why we do what we do watch the blood pressures very carefully. Absolutely. Um, so I'll move on now to uh, really facet uh, fracture dis fractures dislo and dislocations, um, which were first sub uh, subclassified by uh, Allen and Ferguson. Um, and these are uh, obviously unstable injuries as there's an injury then a disruption of that facet joint. Um, you can have a mild subluxation. You can have a unilateral dislocation, which will show about a 25% displacement. You can have bilateral dislocations, which will show about a 50% displacement um, of that uh, anterior, of that uh, superior over the inferior vertebral body. And then you can have a complete dislocation um, with higher energy. And I'm gonna, and another thing to look at uh, and to make sure you're looking at on the x-rays because especially the unilateral dislocations can be difficult to pick up and I, they are the most commonly missed um, fracture, uh, fractures or injuries in the cervical spine um, is, are these unilateral dislocations and you can sometimes pick them up on the AP because um, there's a rot rotation component to the injury if only one facet dislocates. And you can see kind of a misalignment of the spinous processes on the AP. Um, and that's just something to make sure you're always looking for, especially if you only have um, x-rays in the trauma setting for whatever reason. Um, so this is just a CT image of that facet dislocation where this, I was, this should be here. Um, and this is just an image to help, or an animation really to help show what's called that hamburger or reverse hamburger sign. So here you have a normal facet with the buns facing the right direction. And here you have a facet dislocation where the buns are flipped. Um, and then here's a CT demonstrating a normal facet here. Well, a little gap, but normal and a dislocated facet on this side. Um, so, the in patients who present to the hospital awake, alert, and cooperative um, for these uh, facet dislocation injuries, uh, closed reduction can and really should be attempted um, if it's reasonable for that patient. Um, this is a paper from our own Dr. Gelb, who uh, this was really more of a review paper. Uh, to look at the use of MRI and the use of closed uh, reduction for treatment of these injuries. 
And what they found was that early close reduction really is rec in awake in awake patients, and that's really the key because they have to be examinable. Um, is really a recommended treatment for these injuries. Um, one of the contraindications to performing a closed reduction uh, would be any other uh, injury rostral uh, to the facet dislocation. And then in terms of MRI, uh, it is mostly recommended for patients who have these facet dislocations if they cannot be examined during a closed reduction because they have altered mental status, or B, because uh, an anterior or posterior surgical procedure is going to be performed when a closed reduction has failed. And what they found looking through the, the data at the time was that uh, a pre-reduction MRI in patients with uh, facet fracture dislocations found a disc herniation or disruption of the disc in about in up to a half of the patients with these facet subluxation injuries. That said, those findings did not appear to influence the outcomes of closed reductions in awake patients, presumably because as you are reducing or attempting to reduce or applying traction to an awake patient, they can tell you in real time um, if they're having any new symptoms and that can, then you can halt what you are doing and then plan to do an anterior decompression um, to remove that disc. Um, so really, in that in that setting, an MRI is probably um, unindicated or less useful. However, in uh, patients in whom surgery is going to be performed because either the patient is uh, not alert or um, has failed a closed reduction, then an MRI um, can be helpful to help determine um, your surgical approach. Uh, I'll just yeah. wait. I'll just make it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. I mean, you know, this was a literature review in the sense we yeah. it was an evidence based review. It's not. It's not. We we don't look at any biomechanical papers. We don't look right. at average studies. This was just based on reported patient data. Clinical data, uh, correct? Yeah, clinical papers, and, and and it's about ten years old now, of course. But the, mm -hmm. and the, nobody writes about this very much anymore because it seems like it, the data is kind of what it is. Right. Um, right. I, what I'll say is that. It, two things. One, it, it's very clear that it, in the closed reduction is not dangerous in the awake and alert patient. And of all the papers that show just that there are neurologic deterioration, none of them are simple facet dislocations. I mean, they're all there's always some kind of something else strange going on. So in the routine case, I think it's very um, safe. The other thing is that reality is the reason we recommended MRI scan for the patient who's obtunded or whatever is not because there is any data to suggest that it's not safe to do the reduction. It's because there's no data. Right. Right. I mean, there just isn't a series of, of papers or any papers that say we did reductions on patients who did not fit the usual criteria and all of them got paralyzed or none of them got paralyzed or we couldn't tell. Right. So in so in the in the absence of any data, we came down on the side of caution. But that doesn't mean that there's any, you know, you know, what I'm saying right. like right. That those re those recommendations for MRIs and obtunded patients or patients with other injuries are based on an absence of data, not because the data right. is compelling in any way, shape or form. Gotcha. OK, let me let me just clarify something. There is an absence of data with a huge series of patients that um, um, that fit the following criteria. You're not a wake alert cooperative, or alternatively, you go to the operating room for your operative procedure. The data will tell you, although it's weak, um, that if you go to the operating room without an MRI scan and you do a procedure to reduce the patient under anesthesia, that patient can potentially wake up paraplegic if you don't understand what happened to the disco ligamentous complex in the face of a fracture dislocation or facet joint subluxation or injury. There is data to support that. It's not a huge series, 
but that's why in patients that you bring to the operating room, they should have an MRI scan prior to your surgical procedure. Or else, as you can see right here, you may be rolling the dice. There's also data to suggest before a closed reduction in a wake alert cooperative patient, you do your closed reduction and then you get an MRI scan afterwards, there's a higher risk of having a disc herniation after your closed reduction. So your MRI scan should be done after your closed reduction, number one, but before your OR. And you could say, well, why? Because they didn't change your neurologic status. But if you have a big disc herniation, but the patient's neurologically intact, and you have a choice between going anterior and posteriorly, you're probably going to choose an anterior-based procedure to get the disc herniation out that you caused as a result of your closed reduction. So an MRI scan will potentially change your treatment. So there is data to clarify. This is just, this is a, an, an older, this is part of that AO study group that you did, Dan, I think. No, this is not AO at all. This was Mark Hadley put together. Yeah, that special a, series you did in that. Neurosurgery, uh, and I was the token orthopedist uh, yeah. on, on the panel. This was right. a work group that was put That's, together by the Neurosurgical Society. I don't think that, that that's been repeated. That that journal should be repeated because that was good. Well, it was done in 2002, um, and I wasn't. And the criticism was they didn't have anybody from orthopedics on the panel. We redid it in 2012, um, and the data really didn't change. I mean, there was very little new data in that 10 years because people right. have settled. Again, after having read every single one of these papers, I'm not saying that I wouldn't get an MRI. I'm saying that the mechanism of a closed reduction is significantly different than one you do open. Uh, the papers that people will cite based on saying, oh, we didn't get an MRI and now we have a neurologic deficit. Most of those patients didn't have facet dislocations. They had other injuries, but people kind of lumped them in, right? The data is weak. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying that the data for those recommendations is very weak, right? One of the most cited papers in cervical spine surgery, it's amazing that it is, is a JBJS article that was old when I was training by Frank Eismont. It's incredible how much traction and runway this paper gets, but it's performing a operative reduction under anesthesia without having an MRI scan. Right, but none of those. But if you go back and read that paper, none of those patients actually had facet dislocations. <laughs> well, Frank Eisman's pa patient was dislocated. No, they. And they there's had, a whole they series had, out of India. They had, right? they had fracture dislocations. They didn't have facet dislocations. That's the point. People. He took that data and extrapolated it in his head, and then because he was Frank Eisman, he said this. Okay. And so, said, so Duh. let me let me just clarify this. There is data out there in dislocated patients that are getting reduced in the operating room that get paralyzed, okay? So my recommendation to everybody that's in training on this call, because we had a recent patient that went and had a reduction without an MRI, is that you just get the study because it may influence. I don't care if it doesn't influence it, but you get the study because otherwise you're rolling the dice right? 50% of the time, you may have something that may change the outcome of your patient 1% of the time, 2% of the time. But that could be a devastating problem for somebody. So I'd be very careful. That's all I'm saying. Because there is data. I can't quote it to you. I mean, I've given talks multiple times. I, I, I can go back and give you, it's, I agree with Gelb that it is a horrible list in terms of quality of evidence, but it's all level three and four evidence, but it's still evidence to suggest that in those clinical scenarios, it's a dangerous scenario. More information, when you're more armed with more information in a dangerous situation, it may affect your decision-making. That's all I'm saying. I think it's worth everybody doing their own PubMed search and reading the articles for themselves. And it points out, Dan, to going back to the original article, because I think the Eisman article is 
always misquoted, even in the OIT studies. Uh, uh, every, that's always right. There's a difference between what they test and yeah. people and what people recommend and what the data actually say. My my point to the Eismann study is just once again to clarify is that it brought up the whole concept of doing a reduction under anesthesia without information about the disco ligamentous structures. Right? So the Eismann paper, you know, when they reduced them, they herniated the disc, the patient was quadded out, right? I agree. However, there are other papers, once again, that we could do a search. I'm happy to go back to my talks and pull all these papers out. And they're from, you know, outside the United States of people that have had dislocations under anesthesia without preoperative advanced imaging studies other than a CT scan that have had poor neurologic outcomes after their procedure. That's all I'm saying. I'm not talking about doing a closed reduction in a wake alert cooperative patient. I'm an, a huge advocate for that. But I think the, the logistics of, uh, of dealing with the patients now, unless we can't get these patients to the operating room, you know, pretty quickly. And I would say that these are a surgical emergency. So I would bring these patients to the operating room. You know, if it was midnight and they're awake alert cooperative and we could do it with an A team in the morning, I may say, let's try a reduction. But if you can't get them reduced, I would bring them to the operating room, you know, that night. I wouldn't leave them dislocated. Um, but alternatively, if you can get them reduced, then I would get an MRI and then I would do their surgery. If I couldn't, I would get an MRI and then I would do their surgery. That would be my, that's, that's my algorithm in short. I think that, that that's fairly consistent amongst all of us. I don't know if anybody disagrees. So I would do the same as you, Steve. Yeah, but I think you do the same. Eugene? What are we talking? <laughs> it gets so much. I mean, I know you're you're talking about the patient who I brought to the operating room for an ACDF last week. No, no, no I'll talk about that. I'm just giving you a hard time. Have, about who didn't have a dislocation, who had a facet fracture, right? It's a different injury. It was translated and needed a reduction. That's Frank Eismont's paper. No, That's we put him in traction and he reduced. Okay, uh, good. But now you have no idea what's going on. And do an ACDF anyway. And after, by the way, after traction, there's a higher risk of having a traumatic disc herniation, by the way. Right, but not with neurologic deterioration. Um, no, but it may change your approach. I was going to do an ACDF either way. Yeah, but you may have missed the disc herniation that retropulsed behind the body. Which was asymptomatic. Yeah, but it could lead to core compression and delayed myelopathy. Change, changes your approach. Uh, no data. There's data all uh, once again. You got to read more then. <laughs> no data. You should read more. Um, but I agree that if you have a dislocated facet that you the patient can be is a, capable of undergoing a closed reduction, they should. Um, I, I don't know how compelling the data is that it's a surgical emergency in a patient who's neurologically intact when they come in. I think if they have a partial neurologic deficit. The quickest way to get them decompressed is to get them reduced. I agree with that. What if you can't get them reduced, Dan? Well, then I get them an MRI scan and then I go to the operating room. That night? If they have a partial neurologic deficit? Yes. Intact. Intact, but no. can't intact, get them. I put them in, tra put intact, I put them in traction and I wait till the morning because they're intact. But you can't get them reduced. I put them in traction. If they're neurologically intact, then I wait till the morning. You just keep them dislocated in traction. Yeah. What would you do with a hip joint that was dislocated? Different injury. Oh, not yeah. It's you're right. Less concerning. No, I'm not saying it's less. Con well, I mean, there's data to suggest that the longer the hip is out, the more likely it is to undergo vascular necrosis. I don't think vascular necrosis is an issue in a dislocated spine because our nursing care is so good that they'll be able to manage somebody not twist or turn them and well that's why we put them in traction that's why we fix them not to move them 
Right, right, because nothing bad happens in traction. I mean, I think another important thing to bring up, and I've certainly done a lot of cases, you know, I think the exam can sometimes be, sometimes be confusing. I mean, I like the idea of an MRI because I've certainly taken care of a lot of root avulsions where the vertical plexus is evolved off of the cord or something. Then the exam oftentimes doesn't make sense either. So I, I like the idea of more information is better. Well, there's, my there's, personal there's no, no, no one's arguing that if someone has a neurologic deficit that doesn't correlate with the injury that you see, that you shouldn't get an MRI scan. That's a, that now we're into a completely different issue, <laughs> right? If you have an inconsistent neurologic examination with the injury, there's no question that an MRI scan needs to get done, right? That that that's that's but that's a whole different subject. No, but if you talk about I mean, reality, that's I've... completely intact with a sublux, anybody that needs to be reduced that's getting a reduction maneuver. The role for an MRI. That's the question. What state the question again? In somebody that's neurologically intact, awake, alert, cooperative, right? That needs a reduction, right? The role for an MRI. I before you go to the operating room. Yeah. So any reduction, any translation. Any no, dislocation, no, 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 no. any rotation. Three, three millimeters of translation with a fractured fractured facet is not the same as a unilateral lock facet. Sure, it is. All that data that you uh, produce, we should move on. This, this, um, all the data you produced back in 2013 included that patient population. By no, the way, not. No, it did not. It, we looked at dislocations. We didn't look. We we separated out the dislocations from the facet fractures. There's a whole separate paper in that art in that journal issue about facet fractures okay i would ask you guys to pull the um radcliffe paper um uh, it's not radcliffe it's somebody else from jefferson looking at isolated facet fractures and disc herniations related to that it's more recent. It's probably from 2020, Jacob. Maybe you can. I think you pulled it for me for. So I think this the this debate that I did at CSRS two years ago. Um, we'll review those papers looking at traumatic disc herniations with facet injuries. Okay. Unless Pete, you have that that you're going to talk about it. I don't think I have that. There is a Kepler paper that Kepler, talks about facet. Yes, yes, it's yes. facet fractures, and it just looks Correct. at radiographic outcomes of operative versus non. But I didn't comment on the disc. Yes, yes. So you look at that, but, and you get into the disc herniations and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I'll keep moving so we can get there. Um, actually, obviously, the facet, and you know, there, there's more slides on the facet dislocation. We've kind of talked about it a lot. I'll briefly go through these, but I did have a bunch of slides because I knew because um, it is a controversial topic in some ways. So in terms of the close reduction, the technique, um, just for those who haven't done this, definitely should be done in a ER, OR, ICU, somewhere where you can have close observation and frequent x-rays. A patient's position supine in um, Trendelenburg um, with or without leg weights to prevent the patient sliding on the bed with increased weight on their head. Um, and then really they shouldn't be sedated because you have to be getting examinations um, almost constantly with these patients. So you wanna make sure they're awake, but you may give some Valium to help with muscle relaxing as long as the patient is still awake. Um, so Gardner Wells tongs are placed um, two centimeters above the pinna, below the equator. Um, if you place them too anteriorly, you'll extend the neck. To posteriorly, you'll flex the neck. So you really wanna make sure you're in line with that external uh, auditory meatus. Um, the pins are tightened until there's one millimeter of that pin pushing above the surface, which represents about 25 pounds of force. Um, sorry, this is kind of skipping around. So in terms of, you know, the procedure, essentially you're slowly adding weight, repeating the neuro exam, 
repeating x-rays to see if you have a reduction um, in the dislocation and you're pausing between uh, increasing the weights every 20 minutes or so to make sure that there's not a developing neurologic um, uh, injury. And the weights, uh, there's, you know, you could start with different weights. Traditionally, they say three pounds per rostral injury level. Um, and in terms of how far to go and when do you stop, there's not a real answer to that. Um, historically, they said 40 pounds, although I read a one series where 17 of the 24 patients required over 50 pounds for a reduction. Um, some say the limit is 170, but there's a case report of up to 140 pounds. Um, so that's a little bit of a gray area. But at some point, you know, you'll have, you have to, you either get the reduction or you have to say this isn't reducing um, and we go to the operating room. Um, so uh, we'll talk about uh, the different uh, techniques for reducing these in the operating room. Uh, as discussed, generally an MRI is performed prior to going to the operating room. And part of the reason for that is determining uh, your approach. In terms of posterior approach, uh, you're looking directly at the facets from this approach, so it's an easier reduction of the fracture because um, you're looking right at the dislocated facet. And in general, the technique is to place a curette or a pen field or something in the joint um, to almost help to give you some leverage and almost help shoehorn the joint. And in the meantime, you'll put a coker on the spinous process of the level above and pull dorsally um, to bring that uh, facet back over top. Um, you can also use an interlaminar spreader uh, as long as the facet isn't fractured. Um, and finally, if you're unable to get a reduction and you're working from the back, you can just remove the superior articular process so you have no longer, you have, you no longer have a block to the reduction and then that'll pretty much always reduce, allow you to reduce the spine. And then you would perform an instrument infusion. If on the MRI, um, you do see a large disc herniation, um, then you're sort of more obligated to go from the front to make sure that you can decompress that um, disc herniation. Um, and then while you're there, you can attempt a reduction from the front, which can be a little trickier because you're not looking directly at the facets. There's kind of two techniques to do this. One is to use a, a laminar spreader into the disc and you insert that sort of in an upwards angle so that as you spread, you can bring the clamp super, uh, cranially, which will both distract and then also provide that posterior directed um, force to get the facet um, backwards over top of that um, superior facet below. Um, sorry, it's just freezing. Um, another technique is to use cast bar pins, which, um, and you place those uh, convergently as you can see here in figure A, and then as you distract, um, it causes a little bit of that. As you bring those cast bar pins parallel, it causes that flexion moment, and then as you distract, it allow you to unlock that facet joint in the back, and then you can apply a posterior directed force to that superior vertebral body and get um, potentially get your reduction that way. Um, at times, you um, these may be ir uh, may not. You may not be able to reduce these from the front because, again, you're not looking at directly at the facets. In that case, you can perform your discectomy, um, and you can either a use a kick plate with you know a plate that's only fixed to one vertebral body, and then go in the back and perform your reduction and then instrumentation in the back, or you could perform your discectomy, flip to the back, complete the reduction, uh, uh, then have and fixation, and then go back to the front and do plating. Um, so isolated facet fractures um, this is another injury type. This is not a dislocation, but a fracture most commonly through that superior facet. Um, but these do have a high risk for late displacement and development of arthrosis um, and potentially kyphotic angulation. Um, a lot of these can be successfully managed non-operatively. However, you have to monitor them closely. Um, particularly watching for uh, late kyphosis or anterior translation of that superior vertebral body. And the reason for that is as you fracture this facet, you lose that restraint to anterior translation 
of that superior vertebral body. And the larger this fragment is, so they say greater than 40%, meaning if this whole surface is 100%, you want this line to be 40, which would probably be about here or less. As you get greater than 40, this fragment becomes larger and you don't have that any bone left to restrain the superior facet from going forward. Um, so patients with these injuries tend to have uh, disc injuries at that cranial level, um, allowing for that translation. Um, so this is this is that Kepler paper. I'm pretty sure it's the same one, but I, I wasn't looking really for that um, for the information about the disc. But the evidence regarding management of these is a little controversial because the studies that we have don't really look at clinical outcomes. They look at radiographic parameters in determining the outcomes of treatment of non-operative versus operative for facet fractures. And also, most of these studies, they don't separate facet dislocations from pure or from simple facet fractures. Um, but Kepler did review uh, or did a systematic review of these studies and found that for these unilateral facet fractures, there was an 80, there was a greater success rate radiographically with operative management. And in terms of the radio outcome, radiographic outcomes for all treatment groups, the anterior sur patients who underwent anterior surgery or combined approaches uh, had a greater maintained anatomic alignment compared to posterior. Um, floating lateral mass injuries are another type of uh, facet injury um, that's characterized by an ipsilateral pedicle fracture and lamina fracture. These are functionally a two-level injury with uh, increased risk for late instability and you can have um, an inferior level uh, discal ligamentous complex injury 75% of the time and 25% could have a superior level injury. I'm moving a little fast here because I know we're getting towards the end of our time. Um, and these injuries, uh, you can consider operative management certainly, or at least at the very minimum, these require close radiographic follow-up um, for both the facet fractures and the floating lateral mass injuries. Um, as I mentioned previously in that Kepler paper, the radio outcrop Radiographic outcomes are better with operative management, but we don't necessarily have clinical data for that that I could find. Um, you, if there is radiculopathy, you could consider um, a decompression infusion for those injuries. Um, it's important to note which levels uh, you're discussing, and typically the cranial level is an, the unstable segment in isolated superior articular process fractures, whereas typically the caudal level is unstable in the floating lateral mass injuries. And the last thing we'll talk about is surgical timing. Um, this is in relation to neurologic injury. Um, and this was a study, uh, international multicenter protective cohort to look at the effectiveness of early versus late surgery for decompressive surgery after a traumatic uh, spinal cord injury in the cerebral spine. And they looked at six month outcomes. Um, basically they had 313 surgeries enrolled, and they either had early or late surgery. Uh, if you look at the demographics, the patients who underwent early surgery were younger and had worse um, Asia scores uh, at their presentation. Um, so there's obviously some selection bias here in terms of who got early surgery. But in terms of the outcomes, the patients who had early surgery were statistically more likely to have two uh, Asia grade changes at six months, um, which is an interesting way to look at the data is just whereas they're more likely to have two, not necessarily more likely to have three or one or zero, but there is a general shift in terms of um, the patients who had early surgery, they tend to have more improvement versus less, but it's not significant other than that um, two AIS grade change. Um, but this is kind of seen as evidence that early surgery can be beneficial, particularly for decompressive surgery for um, uh, neurologic injury. And there are no increases in complications for the patients who underwent early surgery. Um, and there, one other study just looking at this was a retrospective study. Again, there's selection bias here in terms of patients who had early versus late surgery, but they didn't see any increased complications with early surgery. Um, so there is some evidence that uh, 
there's a neurologic benefit to early surgery with the spinal cord injury. Um, and that uh, improvement in neurologic outcomes tends to be greater in patients who have incomplete injuries, but there's some emerging evidence, which I didn't get into too much here, that um, in patients with complete spinal cord injuries, early intervention may give you a higher chance at neurologic improvement. And that's the end for now, and I'll open it up to any more discussion. Uh, in terms of the neurologic function, Pete, I think it's important to mention when you talk about these things mm -hmm. that, that even, and I don't know where the data sits with this quite honestly, but I, I think it's pretty compelling that in a cervical spinal cord injury, even if you don't change your Asia grade, you know, you're still in Asia, right. e, if you change your level, right. So if you go from a C6 Asia B to a C7 Asia B, right. that's, Huge a difference. that's a humongous increase in your function as an individual because you right. go from being able to feed yourself to being able to transfer and do weight shifting in your chair so you don't get the cubitus ulcers. So, you know, we, we, we focus on the, and that's it, we, so we focus on on the Asia on the stasis study a lot, but we shouldn't forget that surgery has been pretty well shown. And I don't know if it's early or late, but just surgery in general in improving the level of neurologic outcome, right? With mm -hmm. patients with cervical spinal cord injuries, which is a significant benefit to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the major difference so, between a thoracal lumbar injury, why we really play no role in a complete thoracolumbar lumbar injury, we, ne we never decompress, right? We just don't. We reduce, we stabilize, and we're done. We say the injury is the injury. Alternatively, in the cervical spine, in a complete neurologic injury, to Gelb's point, we decompress still because we, the, the data does show that you can gain Asia motor scores in an individual motor group but also, most importantly, what with, with, with Gelb just described, right? So that's the major difference, right? That's the nuance that you guys don't have the experience with seeing because we don't take care of those Asia, those the, 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 that complete population typically, or even incomplete. Incomplete's a different issue. Well, speaking of which, last night, <laughs> just a quick poll. Um, there's a guy that came in complete, C7, T1, you know, flexion distraction injury would you wait till the morning or take in the middle of the night complete c7 i would take them i would get them into the operating room decompress and fuse them within one day i wouldn't do it in the middle of the night complete and out of spinal shock you mean That yeah. wouldn't change my management. Yeah, I mean, I think that you do it. I, I think twenty-four hours is, you know, that's been our that's that has that has been our standard. Yeah, so that's what we're gonna do. That's what I decided. I mean, it came in last night. He's booked for today, so we're gonna get him done today. But, you know, that's uh, I don't know. We do see these things sometimes. I mean, I I take my incompletes in the middle of the night and I'll do them. The ones that are complete. You should wait till the morning. I'm just kind of curious what other people would do. 